This is one which um, starts out looking like a Ford Mustang, and if, you're, if you have amazing dexterity, which I don't, uh, you can turn it into something like that. So if I'm going to pass this around. The idea is that something which, it's the same object, but the form is completely different before and afterwards. But then I thought the transfiguration isn't about inanimate objects, it's about living beings. And I started to wonder a little bit more, and I suddenly remembered this story. Do you know who this is? This is the Ugly Duckling. And this is that great uh, fairy story, children's story, where the Ugly Duckling is born and doesn't look quite like its siblings and gets rejected by all of the, uh, the others, and uh, feels terribly dejected, and in the end goes off and has to live a rather sort of soulful life on his own. Oh, there you go, not too much. Um, but, and a farmer rescues him. But eventually, he's so desperate, he throws his lot in with a group of swans who welcome him completely as if he was one of theirs. And he grows up and, gosh, amazing, he turns into a beautiful swan. That, in a sense, I think that's kind of human, not human, but a you know, sort of a, a living being example, maybe, of transfiguration. Well then, um, um, I had a nerdy moment. Um, Paul Hunt, years ago, who thought my New Testament Greek was considerably better than it, I promise you it really is, gave me a copy of the New Testament in Greek. And I went away out of curiosity to see what the Greek word was. This is really nerdy, I'm sorry about this. Um, for which we translate as transfiguration. And the answer is, it's that. I'm sure you can all translate that without difficulty, of course. Um, I, I do it a little bit at a time, and it comes out as metamorphosis. That's the word that, that is being talked about. So transfiguration in the, in the Bible is metamorphosis. Now, I think of, I'm not very good at these things, but I think metamorphosis is about that. It's about the biological journey of a caterpillar to a butterfly. It's a living being that completely changes form. Um, and, and at the end, you'll tell me lots of other examples of metamorphosis. And I'm deeply grateful that Chris Dowson isn't here at this moment. Um, but um, I, I think a tadpole into a frog is probably another example of metamorphosis. It's something which completely changes form whilst it's the same living creature before and afterwards. And uh, I'm told that in metamorphosis, not only does the form change, but the habitat changes as well, as does the behavior. So it's not just a change of form, it's a completely radical internal transformation of the being from one thing into another. So keep that, hold on to that imagery for a moment of the caterpillar into the beautiful butterfly. Well, if there's one toy that you can buy which exemplifies transfiguration, it has to be Lego. Lego is the greatest toy for transforming things from one shape into another shape. And I want to tell you a little Bible story using Lego. And this Bible story uh, is a kind of precursor to the transfiguration. It's the story of the baptism of Jesus. So this is John the Baptist. Uh, you can tell by the waistcoat, this is his you know, um, sackcloth, and he's carrying his lunch, which is um, honey and locusts. And here he is marching off to work, John the Baptist. And um, here he is announcing to the huge crowds he would draw. Massive numbers of people came to hear him preach. And he preached this great baptism of repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven draws near, he said. And uh, as he did it, he was baptizing people in the water. A baptism, they would come and he said, oh, I'm going to wash you externally clean, but somebody's going to come after me who's going to wash you internally clean. So here he is. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who will baptize you spirit. And there were crowds of people lining up to go. And here in the queue, here's all the people. Oh, gosh, can I go back? Oh, we'll get there. Here's the queue of people waiting to be baptized. And in the middle of it, you can see Jesus. It appears to be November. He's got the sort of moustache, as you can see. Um, but, but there he is, ordinarily lining up with all of the rest of the people. Um, he was of course, John the Baptist's cousin, John knew exactly who he was, but there he was nonetheless lining up in this queue. And we finally come to this glorious moment where Jesus is baptized in the water by John. And, and this, remember that little interplay that says, goodness me, shouldn't you be baptizing me? And Jesus says, no, this is the way it should be. 
and um, oh, no. Ooh, um, if you were confused about this parrot, I promise you it's not a parrot. It's the Holy Spirit. It's a dove. Just, just think. Be creative. Um, and here's the, the Holy Spirit falling on Jesus. Look, and the voice comes from heaven. God speaks. This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Now I want to just at this moment I want to stop and show you a little clip of film, which is the Transfiguration. So let's just, which he explained to them what was going to happen. He said, "Look, you've got to get real about this. I am going to die very shortly." And they were, not surprisingly, completely bereft. They were... Um, move on to the, there we go, transfiguration. They were, um, they were utterly distraught at the idea that everything they believed in, everything they'd invested in, everything they had grown to love and appreciate was about to be taken from them. And they were jolly unhappy about the whole thing. And it's clear that they were pretty grumpy for about a week. And in the end, Jesus said to them, or at least he said to... Um, to uh, the three most close, Peter, James, and John, his closest inner circle. He said, look, guys, come on. Let's go up the mountain. Let's have some time out. Let's go and pray together. Let's just chill. Let's just go away for a little while. And they set off on this walk. So three of them walk with this very human Jesus up the mountain. And as they get to the top of the mountain, they have this unbelievable, impossible experience where suddenly Jesus is utterly transformed to something they hardly recognize. And <clears throat> interestingly, he's transformed into something which is the Jesus that you might see after the ascension. If you read um, the words of uh, John in, um, in Revelation, it describes Jesus like this. It says, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. This is the imagery in Revelation of the divine Jesus. And what they were seeing was a glimpse, not of the human Jesus, but of the divine Jesus. But then there he was standing with Moses and Elijah. And you could wonder how he recognized Moses and Elijah. I mean, they hardly would have seen photographs of them. It rather asks questions about how we would recognize people in uh, in. But they did recognize them. It was completely clear. And Moses and Elijah were having a conversation with Jesus about exactly what was going to happen and what would happen after the cross and the resurrection. But they were so absolutely overawed by this experience. They were nervous before they went. They were even more nervous now. And they just fell down. You could see them sort of falling down on their feet. Well, here we have this amazing dialogue with Jesus Moses and Elijah. And now Moses, of course, was represented the law. And, uh, you know, Moses received the Ten Commandments. And Elijah was perhaps the most significant of the, of the prophets, of the Old Testament people who heard God's word for the people. And they always believed that Elijah would come before the Messiah. It was written in the Old Testament, Elijah will come before the Messiah. So in a sense, they might not have been surprised but they didn't know when they looked at this. Were they looking at history? Was this, were they looking, you know, these are people from the past. So are we looking at a piece of history going on here? Or are we looking at perhaps the future? And actually, it wasn't the past at all, of course. They were being a glim given a glimpse of the future. They were seeing this remarkable picture of what would happen after the cross and the resurrection. So they'd gone there, worried about what was going to happen in a few days' time desperately upset by this idea that Jesus would die. And here they were being given a glimpse of what was beyond it. They were given just a little hint to give them some reassurance of what would happen uh, beyond all of this. And uh, significantly, Moses and Elijah, great, amazing, incredible men, but, the, but at the end of the day, men. They were human. They were, they were great, but they weren't perfect. Moses, for goodness sake, was a murderer. You know, these were human ordinary, not terribly ordinary, human people actually standing in the presence of Jesus. And this was this image they were being given that actually it's for all, it's, you know, it wasn't the Archangel Gabriel and, and the Archangel Michael. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the heavenly host standing either side of Jesus. It was two human beings. This is a place for you and me. You know, we can stand either side of Jesus. We've been given that picture of us in this heavenly context standing beside Jesus. 
And in this context, you've got Jesus and the law and the prophets. And Jesus is saying, or rather God is saying, listen to my son. I, you know, there's the Old Testament, there's the prophets. But who do I want you to listen to? I want you to listen to Jesus. That's the message. I want you to hear the voice of Jesus in the context of the Old Testament and the prophets. Here we go. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. That's the message. Here he comes to us in all of this. And uh, Jesus said to them, look, as they walked back down the mountain and the, the vision had passed and they were again reunited with this very human Jesus, he said, don't tell anybody about this. Just don't speak about it. And interestingly, um, John, who was there, didn't. The only gospel in which you won't find this story is John's gospel. It's in all of the others, but not in John's. He didn't say anything about it um, at all. Well, um, I was, um, when I was thinking about this talk, um, on my desk was a piece of paper, which some of you will recognize. We had a, a men's discussion group on Saturday morning. We were having coffee and bacon butties and a chat. And uh, David and Russell were leading us, and they passed around this little piece of paper, um, which is a, a verse from Romans. And this verse was sitting haunting me as I was thinking about this talk, and the verse says this, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I had another of those nerdy moments and I went off to look at the New Testament in Greek and to work out what word was there for transformed in this passage as Paul talks to the Romans. And guess what? It's the same word. It's that picture again of the caterpillar to the butterfly. Paul is saying to this church in Rome, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And here's this imagery, be transformed like the caterpillar to the butterfly. Be transformed, if you like, like the ugly duckling into the beautiful swan, or be transformed like the human fallible person standing at the left and the right side of Jesus. And it says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is a word for us here and now. Being a Christian is about living in the today. And in the, in the Lord's Prayer we say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we don't have to wait for judgment day for this moment of transformation. This is about being transformed in the now. So I leave you with that thought of metamorphosis as a word for us today. And, and capture the imagery and, and, and let our hearts be open to being changed by the presence of God. Being inwardly transformed like that caterpillar to that butterfly.